I'd like to introduce J.P. Hall, uh, Eastern Regional Coordinator for uh, Indiana Landmarks, and he's going to introduce our speakers. Good morning, everyone. It's still morning, I think, right? Uh, I'm excited to uh, introduce the next speakers and, and, and really uh, the next topic. I'm a huge, huge advocate of uh, the Main Street approach. Uh, it has a, a place in my heart as I, I was a former uh, director of a Main Street organization, a small Main Street organization uh, in Wabash, Indiana. So I have seen it work. Uh, uh, it's a tried and tested approach, and there's, I think, uh, at last count, maybe 2,000 or so Main Street organizations uh, around the country. So uh, it's, it's a very valuable uh, economic development approach, and that's one thing that is oftentimes lost when you hear uh, the term Main Street. Uh, I liken it to uh, and often refer to it as a place-based economic development approach, and so I'm excited to hear about about that from our speakers today. Our first speaker is, uh, and I have a bio here, is uh, Colette Childress. Uh, she is with the Indiana Office of Community and Rural Affairs. She serves as project manager with the project management and development team. Colette and the project team is overseen by Matt Crouch, senior project manager. And I saw both of them actually at the uh, recent uh, uh, National Main Street Conference, so I, I was happy to touch base with them there, and we were representing Indiana. So, uh, Okra is part of Lieutenant Governor Eric Holcomb's family of business alongside Indiana Housing and Community Development, Office of Small Business and Entrepreneurship, Department of Agriculture, Indiana Office of Tourism Development, and the Office of Defense Development. A lifelong Hoosier with a Southern soul, Colette has uh, lived in Indiana her whole life aside from spending her summers in South Carolina. How lucky. Uh, Colette studied psychology at St. Joseph College in Rensselaer and criminal justice at Indiana Wesleyan in Marion, Indiana. Her passion was always to work for the government when the right agency came along. Looks like that happened. Uh, before arriving at Okra, Office of Community and Rural Affairs, Colette worked in promotion and event management, working with both small and national brands, including Degree, General Motors, Newcastle Ale, Adidas, and many others. In that role, she was able to flourish in project management and eventually moved on to do project management with multi-state voice and data firm. It was during uh, the firm's closing that she discovered Okra and immediately knew that it was exactly the agency she was looking for. Since then, she has been passionately working for Hoosiers in all 92 counties and loving every minute of it. Besides her role with Okra, Colette uh, enjoys crossfitting, being a court-appointed special advocate, and spending time with her husband. Recently married, both uh, she and her husband enjoy spending time renovating their home and landscape and being a proud keeper of one adorable dog who will happily do your taxes for food. Good, good to know. Um, I don't have a bio for Scott, but uh, I can vouch for Scott. Uh, I've, I've known Scott uh, ever since I've been in this role with Indiana Landmarks, and he's been a great asset to me, and uh, I know he's been a great asset to Richmond. Uh, he's currently the director of Center City Development Corporation here in Richmond, which is Richmond's Main Street organization, and prior to that, he served as a city planner for at least a decade or more, I assume. And, uh, and then prior to that, uh, Scott uh, served as director of the Eastern Regional Office for Indiana Landmarks. So uh, I think brings a valuable preservation perspective to, uh, to Main Street and to Richmond and has been a, a great advocate for uh, preservation here. So uh, with no further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Okay, so I, is this working? Can you guys hear me? Okay, so I tend to be a little more mobile. Um, I'm gonna break things, so that just happened. It's a great way to start. Nope, not the right one. How about this one? Okay, if I'll, I'll try and stand still. I tend to be a little more um, hand gestury and a little more uh, mobile when I walk, so I, I apologize. Um, so I am with Okra. I figured the only way to kind of give you guys a little bit of accolades for sitting still so long and listening to our bios to tell you that I do have a crazy dog, and I almost mean it when I say she would do your taxes for money. She's the most food-motivated person I would ever meet. Um, so I am lucky enough to work with Okra, and I'm going to go over very quickly a couple things with you guys. The first one is that Main Street approach. There is no one that I think that could do a better job speaking about 
really what it's like to be on the ground and implement the Main Street, then Scott here. He's done a phenomenal job with Richmond, dare I stay stellar job here in Richmond, um, making sure that Main Street's really, really flourishing here. So one of the things um, I do wanna tell you is I'm gonna move through really quickly. This is usually a 45 minute to an hour presentation. So don't panic when I flip through screens too fast for you to take notes. One, it's all available. Um, Scott's offered to make sure that you guys have these presentations. And two, it's actually all available on our website. We've done workshops recently and our conferences and all of these slides uh, more in depth are also available there. So without much further ado, I'm gonna try and click, it's not working. There we go. Okay, so OCRA, it's very important to us that all of our programs meet our mission and our vision. One of the things that OCRA really, really is passionate about, aside from Main Street, is making sure that we work with local, state, and national partners to provide resources and technical assistance to aid communities in their vision for shaping and achieving economic development. For us, as a state agency, we want to make sure that your community is doing what it needs to do for you guys. What is happening in Richmond is not going to be the same thing that is necessarily happening in Batesville because they need to be customized for each person. We can provide programs, but we make them fluid enough for the most part that you guys can adapt them to be exactly what you need. Mm -hmm. Maybe. So. The Okra 2015 impact. This is just some quick numbers that we decided to push out so you could see that we're not just this vegetable agency. We actually are a little more fun than that. We tend to do um, a lot of things in a lot of communities, but no, most people don't actually know who we are. So hopefully today you'll get to know more about us and some of the opportunities that we can offer for you guys. So we have 115 communities that we've personally assisted through Okra, and that's in 2015, and we have been nonstop in 2016. So we're excited to see what these numbers are next year. And we have secured $27 million. So that's a big number, and that's not counting all of our federal dollars, to push out to Indiana communities. So I'm gonna tell you some of those opportunities we have for you guys. So our overall impact, $820 million. That's a big number for a lot of people who didn't know who I was before or our agency was before I walked up here today. So $820 million. Again, I'm gonna tell you how you guys can kind of get involved in that and learn more about what you can do for your communities. So what we do, I don't, that went weird on me, so bear with me. The biggest challenges in Indiana, you guys all know, declining populations, uh, lack of resources, declining school enrollment, and increasing age. What we want to do is help you work your way towards achieving a goal that's going to help these throughout. Yep, maybe. Okay, and I'm a quick clicker, like, oh, it's not working, let me click 12 times. So some of the programs that we do here are the Main Street program. As you'll see, we have a brand new logo. Sorry, I, I'm going to struggle with stepping away from the mic. So as you see, this is the Indiana Main Street program. Our hometown collaboration initiative, which I see um, we've got some partners here today. Our community readiness initiative, again, we have some partners here today. And then, of course, the seller communities, which anyone I know Richmond's here is very familiar with. Okay. Maybe. Here we go. So, the community liaisons. How many of you guys have actually spoken with or met your Okra community liaison? Oh. You guys have got to meet them. They are your front door to government. I always joke that everyone needs to know a guy. You know, something breaks in your house, somebody knows somebody who works on heating and air. Somebody knows somebody who can fix that. So we're the somebody who knows somebody, we're the somebody. So the good thing about what we do is, is those field staff are on the ground and they're ready to help. They live in their communities. They are personally invested in making sure that your communities are thriving. No matter what it is, they're there to help you move forward with it. Again, our Main Street program is one of our most recognized programs we have. Um, it is not a standalone agency. It is absorbed within the Indiana Office of Community and Rural Affairs. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary with uh, the agency, and, Okra and Indiana Main Street actually celebrated its 30th. So in those 10 years, it's been moved over legislatively to the Indiana Office of Community and Rural Affairs. The way that the Main Street program works is there's not just one person. You don't have to wait on one person to serve all 92 counties. We have four project development team members. Myself is one. Um, 
and we work on the overall big picture of Main Street. Those eight community liaisons I told you about, they're the boots on the ground and they're really going to make sure that if you want to get it started or you've got it started and you're kind of fizzling out, they're there. They're at your board meetings. We're all there to make sure you have everything you need to get going. We also have great partnerships across the state. For example, I was lucky enough to meet JP at the Main, National Main Street Conference and I was amazed at how many people he already knew. So for me, it was like, great, I've got another partner. Let's make sure that we can utilize JP and help pass him along, sorry, wherever we could. So again, if you need help with anything in your community, the Ochre Community Liaison is a great first step. So as we just went through, we've got four project development team members who are working to implement Main Street on the state level. And then you have your eight regional field staff. And there's pictures, there's a pretty map, we color coded it, we kind of made it easy. And also if you call any of them, even if it's the wrong one, they'll make sure you get the information and get you to the right person. All right, so the Office of Okra and the Indiana Main Street, we work with the National Main Street organization. National Main Street makes sure I don't want to say franchise because I think it cheapens the program, but it, it works that way. It's an easy way for me to explain it. National Main Street helps to set up standards that every state who has the program implements accordingly. So if I go to Illinois, the program might be a little different, but the core pieces are all the same. And that is, they're all designed, and I'm going to click through these real quick. They take four points. Four points are economic vitality, organization, design, and Promotion, I always forget that when I say implementation. Um, what they do is they look at each of these as four distinct pieces that tie together into one. So again, without all of these four points, you're not going to get to the one thing, which is economic vitality within your community. Main Street is very important because it looks at historic preservation as an economic driver. For example, if you drive through a town at 50 miles an hour and you see nothing in their downtown, you're probably not going to stop. You're going to get to the next location who has a pretty building or a pretty awning or something that looks like there might be people in that downtown and you're going to stop there for lunch. So one of the things that they really do is look at the overall Main Street and that can be anything. We've had communities come in and say, I live on Main Street, therefore I'm in Main Street. And we're like, that's not really how that works, but good try. So Main Street is what you guys designate as a, at a community level as your defined downtown area. That's your focus area. That's really where you are focusing on a lot of your Main Street business. So you're gonna take these four points. And again, Scott is a has done a phenomenal job and he's gonna tell you what it's like to actually implement the program. Okay. This might be new, even to Scott. Um, this is what Main Street has rolled out recently, and we're gonna be rolling out at our community exchanges, which are programs that focus on Main Street, but everyone's welcome to go to. What it is, is we say, they decided, I can't say we say, they decided and we agree that communities really need to have a shared vision, a shared goal, more so than just, I think we had a plan on the shelf six years ago, let's really make it happen. And what those are is those are transformation strategies. So when he gets back to it, they're the arrows that are running this way. So they're the top ones, they're two black arrows running right and left. Those transformation strategies ask you to take a look at your market and find out what common things are you looking for to move your community forward. For example, if you have a huge millennial population right now and your biggest focus is on getting you know, new homeowners, you want to look at their market data for your millennials and take an approach that's really going to fit into something like that. One of the other things we found is some communities, uh, let's take Elwood, for example, they're, they're a very big agricultural community. They have a very, very big transient popula population in the area. So working with that community and really addressing it and customizing it to fit that, they were able to be much more successful. Um, there is a whole list of transformation strategies. That's a new word. We're all getting really familiar with that, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. But it really says let's take some market data, let's really take a look at some information, and take our four points and focus towards those. So your economic vitality committee and your design committee aren't going their own direction any longer. They're actually sharing that vision and moving forward with something that everyone has as their common goal. So you'll see design, organization, promotion, and economic vitality, which used to be economic restructuring and economic, it's been a few different things. Um, always tended to be the one that no one really understood what it did. So they tried to give it a better name that people got excited about using. Um, so they all 
are going to intersect with that transformation strategy. All right, so the Indiana Main Street, the four main things that it does is it's going to enhance the physical, I know I'm going to do this for a while, I think. It's going to do a lot of different things, but most importantly, it's going to help with historic preservation and it's going to enhance the overall vision and economic quality of your community. You're okay. Um, so it's going to help you identify new market opportunities, create a sustainable organization. Just like JP talked about, Main Street is a great replicable type of pattern behavior for you guys to look at and say, you know what, it worked really well with Main Street, let's try to implement it moving forward. We have another program that we found great success in replicating that behavior, and that's our hometown collaboration initiative. Um, really focusing on learning that, having that core foundation in place and learning good behaviors and replicating that moving forward in other ideas and other ways um, has really been successful in our communities. And then promoting downtown as a center of commerce. Um, we're not going to help you tear down Main Street and build an outdoor shopping mall. I apologize. We're also not, um, excuse me, gone with the knots. What we will do is help you take a look at your community and say, how can we help you make this downtown better? How can we help you preserve your, your fabric? We've had a few communities come in. I'll leave them um, the names out. And they have torn down all the old buildings. They've built new and they asked to come in for our Indiana Main Street. And unfortunately, we can't because there's no historic preservation left for us. There's no historic fabric there for us to build off of because that's so important to Main Street. Okay, I'm gonna try this again, see if I can get it. Okay, so really quick, I can't tell you any other program in the state other than basic, I did it, see? That over 20,000 jobs was created as a direct impact directly related to Main Street organizations was 20, over 21,000 jobs. That's amazing. 900 public improvement projects. I saw Margie was here. I, I can tell you some amazing ones that she's done within her community. Maybe, maybe, let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you about some placemaking programs. Now here's where it gets fun. I guarantee if I asked a handful of you guys to tell me something that you wanna do in your community that cost $500,000, 50,000 to 150,000 or 10 to 30,000 dollars you could probably rattle off five of them right away so I'm going to tell you different funding opportunities we have and again I'm going to move through these quick because I want Scott to have an opportunity to speak um, the first one is the historic renovation grant program that was the former historic tax credit legislation moved that over to our agency to work as a grant program um, did any of you guys submit applications or know of places within your communities okay we actually were very concerned because we rolled it out so quick um, dare I say we were kind of building that plane as we flew it but we started rolling that out and just taking everything we could get we were happy for all the feedback we had from landmarks it is a strong partnership with DNR and DHPA and we actually came through and created the grant program that provided up to hundred thousand dollars to preserve and rehabilitate historic structures so the best way, yeah, we're good, okay. So the lead applicant must be, you're okay, I can skip through these. Um, again, I apologize, because this is interesting for me. It's almost like I need to do charades, we might be better. Um, so the lead applicant needs to be joint ventures, businesses, individuals. We can do a lot of different things. What we cannot do, and this is the first time as an agency we've done this, this is not for government. This is not for municipalities. These are not for regional redevelopment commissions. These are for the individual homeowners or small businesses to really get access to these funds to do historic renovations. So this is, we had $1.2 million that, got, uh, that will be awarded in November. Um, we just recently had our LOIs went through. Out of 50 some applications, we only had six that DNR found were ineligible. The ineligibility on, um, the eligibility relies on historic eligibility. We have a few threshold pieces that does require um, for our agency, but the majority of being eligible this round really relied on DNR, saying that it was historic, it was contributing, it was within um, a local um, historic district. There was a lot of different ways that you could come in. And a lot of people found out that they were historic, and we had a lot of people very upset with us because they said their building was more than 50 years old. How was it not historic? And we had to rely heavily on DHPA to help us really move forward with how that worked. 
So again, it's been a very strong partnership with DNR and DHPA. They're also going to be responsible for final approval. Um, we have been very transparent on our website with the dates for these and when they go over for a review for their council meetings. Um, the eligible activities for these, they're, it's limited to the exterior. That includes roof, structure repair, uh, tuck pointing, really anything historic in nature to the exterior of the building. We had a lot of people come in um, for, they wanted to add like second story um, emergency exits, things like that, and that, that really wasn't meeting the purpose of the grant. We had one community come in that by far, as I joked in my bio that I have a southern soul, they had the perfect plantation porch and we were so excited and they were going to re restore it to what it needed to look like and we were looking through it and we're like this is a great design we looked at the picture again something caught my eye and i said this building looks like it was built in 1940 something how are they going to put this antebellum porch on this so we started looking some more and then we read this little fine print at the bottom that says we drove down the street one day and saw this porch and we're going to put it on our building because it's going to be historical at that point so we were like um no that's that's not how that works so we've done a lot of educating not only with ourselves but with individual citizens that say historic preservation is important it's not just lipstick on a pig here it's really knowing what you're doing it's working with that so we've actually started working with some of our communities saying do you have any books we can put in the library that we can say here's free resources about historic preservation if you guys find some on your shelf give them to your main street directors or to your local historic preservations and say here's a free resource you can access them anytime it's a great way we found for homeowners who have no idea where to start to go learn a little bit for free okay and it's also really fun because very few people want to give money for roofing. So we were pretty excited about that. So $100,000 was the max amount they could request. We're hoping to do this again in 2017. I do apologize. Um, I should have started with that. Um, this is all based on legislation. Um, so it's a max amount of $100,000, but no greater than um, or 35%. So again, you can't just come in for $100,000. It can only be 35% of your, pro your total eligible project costs. Um, minimum $10,000. We knew we needed to set a minimum because if not, we were going to have like, I need two bricks repaired. And we did have several that, that came in and we had to work with them on their budget because somehow they came in under $10,000. <laughs> um, match requirements, again, local match. We don't do any in kind for this program. It's one of our only program that doesn't accept in kind. Um, and then you have to actually document a committed match funds. A fun story, if I, um, and I say I, I mean, if OCRA ever asks you to show proof of funds, please don't give me your bank account or social security number. Um, that happened a lot, we found. So you're going to see this right here, four hard copies and one digital come through on every application I'm going to talk to you guys about. All right. So important dates. Those have all since passed. If you did not submit an LOI, um, sorry. We're hoping that, again, 27 dates forthcoming waiting on legislation to tell us we did a good job and we can move forward with it. So the Main Street Revitalization Program. Main Street Revitalization Program is our federal dollars. This is gonna be up to $500,000 for facades, streetscapes, and things like that. We want to encourage communities with eligible populations to focus on long-term community development within a defined downtown area. The, defi the population we're talking about is a non-entitlement community. You do have to be a non-entitlement community to apply for CDBG funds. Um, here I am with acronym SOUP. So a non-entitlement is a HUD determination. Uh, CDBG is community development block grants that are handed to us by HUD. Um, and if you're not sure if you fall within that community, your community liaison is the guy so and girl. So you wanna reach out to them and they'll give you the answers. Um, so the eligibility requirements, it does need to meet a national objective. In this case, it is slum and blight. Don't panic. Just because you have to say it's slum and blight doesn't mean that we're going to consider it or it's going to penalize you in any way. It's just a national objective. We do have to have you um, designate for this. No subrecipient, so you can't take the money and hand it out. There's a lot of requirements on this, and this does require you to work with a grant administrator. Our agency certifies grant administrators. If you're ever questioning one, um, you can always look on our website and make sure that you've, you're have you working with one or reach out again to your community liaison. Um, go ahead and skip forward. So you can move forward again. One thing with CDBG, you have to have citizen feedback. You have to show us proof that it's been ran in the local paper. There's a lot of different pieces when I say it's federal dollars versus state dollars that you need to work with. Federal dollars is going to be a bigger funding pool, but there's going to be more stipulations on that. So again, maximum grant amount is $500,000 per community with a $5,000 um, 
individual like beneficiary amount. So minimum 20% match. So 20% match of $500,000 you need to make sure the community has in place or secured in funding. Go ahead and move forward. And then uh, the open allowance and requirements, you can have two CDBG grants as a community, city or town. Um, you can have three if you're applying as a county. So some of the things you can do, actually if you see ADA ramps and sidewalks, this is one of our only programs, is our federal programs that allows for ADA compliance. Um, environmental review, lighting, curb cut, sidewalks, underground electrical. There's a lot of different things you can do with the MSRP dollars. Um, ineligible activities. Unfortunately, we can't let you campaign with any of our dollars ever. We can't let you buy booze with any of our dollars ever. Um, we can't let you buy and or tear down buildings with our dollars. And then again, you can't campaign or pay your taxes. I think if we ever allowed people to pay their taxes with our grants, it would be the most well-known grants on the planet. Um, so we do require you to work with a certified grant administrator. You can skip forward with that. There's the details. And then again, here's some important dates. This one, if you have not already started having a conversation with your community liaison and you want to come in for something like this, call them when you leave here today or during lunch and they will definitely call you, get something set up and tell you if this would work for you or not. Our place-based investment grant. Um, Margie's here, they were one of our recipients. Um, we are, I'll go through this and DEG very quickly because they're very, very similar. Downtown, our place-based investment is a partnership with the Indiana Office of Tourism Development, so IOTD. What that is, is the whole point is it's designed to draw a crowd and a unique crowd gathering experience to your downtown. I want this to be fun. I want it to be original. I want it to be something that is dynamic for your community. I have seen application after application come in and it is almost verbatim what the community down the street is doing. There's nothing unique to your community if it's identical to what eight other communities are doing. Put a spin on it make it your own so the partnership because we are a strong partnering agency we understand that two if not ten are better than one we take a look at this and we say in order to come in for this you've got to start having that conversation you've got to partner with another eligible organization the more partners the better it does make you much more competitive in the grant application process so your CVBs your local units of government your Indiana Main Street your youth so your schools I don't care if it's an elementary school or a university a school works really well um, a competitive project, it needs to be unique, should be multi-purpose, non-traditional, crowd building, again, think big. Um, there for a while I had hand over fist applications for splash pads. You're going to see here in a second, splash pads, bathrooms are not eligible um, in downtown Wi-Fi because again, everybody was giving me the exact same application, um, but nothing was really unique to them. Some of the ineligible activities, again, you can't buy booze. We're not going to let you campaign. You can't tear down buildings. You can't buy buildings. You can't pay your taxes. Wi-Fi, splash pads. And if you've done, um, if, if you have come in for money for a PBIF project, it is not sustainable to come in for the second phase of it. And we've actually started seeing that a lot. One of the big components of all of our projects is for you to explain sustainability to us. We want to know when we walk away and that last dollar has been invested, what you're going to do with it, how you're going to move it forward, how you're going to maintain it. So when you tell me that you're coming in for the next round of funding to help pay for the next portion, we're going to start questioning really what's that community buy-in on that piece. Um, so we allow in kind for this. And that is if someone's donated the land or you've recently acquired it, if someone's going to do volunteer labor. Main streets are a great place. Again, they've got the best volunteer pools. Um, renderings, land acquisition, donated equipment, anything like that will help you get in there because it's going to help your cost. Um, In-kind details, again, these are all fine print details that we can show. You guys can review when you're looking at the application. Uh, requirements are on state programs are always 1 to 1.5. It's a one-to-one -one cash, and that other 0.5 can be any combination of cash or in-kind. So if you're asking for $20,000, we're going to need to see $30,000 coming in, of which at least 20 of it is cash match. Again, four hard copies, one digital. Every application with Okra is due on a Friday at 4 p.m. We're always going to announce our programs on Mondays. So those are two dates you can always look for. And funded projects always get announced on Thursdays. Community performance indicators are CPIs. That is something you guys are going to see as a question on every application, be it CDBG or state dollars now. And like we talked about earlier, every community is facing population decline and a decline in school enrollment, things like that. We're asking you to begin identifying as a community where you stand. 
I don't ask you to be an economist. I don't ask you to have the best answer. I ask you to be informed. So as an agency, we stepped in and we said, you need to start moving yourself forward and realizing where you are and taking a look at these programs and figuring out if this is really what's gonna help your community move itself forward. Um, so again, this is a competitive process. Um, if you have questions about competitiveness or eligibility of any projects, your community liaison is gonna be your best place. Um, I'm actually gonna open these applications for PBIF in August. DEG, we're gonna talk about here in a second. I'm opening those on Monday. So those are for Main Street only. Okay, so our Downtown Enhancement Grant Program. Everything is basically the same as place-based investment with the one stipulation that you have to be in Indiana Main Street. You only have access to uh, downtown enhancement grant funds and Main Street revitalization funds if you are an Indiana designated Main Street. Again, just because you live on Main Street, I wish I didn't have to say this, doesn't mean you are in Indiana Main Street. Um, you just do have to be part of our program. We have 112 communities across the state. Likely yours is one of them. And if it's not and you want to move forward with it, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. So you do have to partner with another minimum of one. Uh, what we don't want to see is that Main Street's moving forward with completely redoing a building. And we found out later that the city has agreed to tear that building down in two weeks and they're not talking to each other. And we just granted them $50,000 to move forward or something like that. So we do require you to partner with someone in your community to show good faith and actually show that more than one person is invested in this project. Competitive projects need to enhance your downtown, drive economic um, drive economic investment into your downtown, excuse me, showcase community support and be part of previous planning. Um, you are welcome to say, we have this great idea. We just heard about it yesterday and we'd like to do it. And here's maybe where it fits in. That's okay. But we want to show that it wasn't just, I heard you had money. I think we might need money. Here's what we want to do. So again, competitive projects. Anytime you see competitive projects, it's a tip. If you can check every box on here, your application is gonna be more competitive than the person who didn't. Doesn't mean it's not eligible. Competitive is really where, when you're coming in for money, that you can really rise to the top. Eligible activities on these, you can do revolving loan programs, you can do facade renovation programs, you can do facade renovations, you can do murals, you can do pocket parks, you can do benches, anything you can think of, call me. I love Unique, I like Outside the Box. These are great programs. Um, some ineligible activities, these are almost exactly what's on PBIF. So again, you can't do restrooms, you can't pay your taxes, can't buy booze, um, you can't do a lot of different things, but they're all within reason, I promise, I think. Um, and then the eligible in kind, again, exact same as the place-based investment, yes. Sorry, what is the source of the question? These are all state dollars, yes, yes. The only one that I talked about today that is federal is the MSRP, and that's the $500,000 one. Um, In-kind details, exact same as our other one. Match requirements, exact same. We try, believe it or not, to make grants easy for you guys to apply for. Um, and additional requirements is, if we give you money within three years, you're not eligible for another three years. And that's just because we don't want to penalize great grant writers, but we also want to make sure that we're investing across Indiana. And then submissions, again, exact same as every other program. So important dates. I'm announcing these are open on Monday. And then the letter of intent is actually going to be due July 15th. The one new adjustment to our state programs is right now we're giving a try to doing a letter of intent very similar to what you do for the federal programs. And that's just your rough draft. That's just take an attempt, make an effort, tell us what you're looking at. And our CLs are going to reach out to you and say, here's a really great way to make it more competitive. Again, here's your CL map. It's kind of blurry. We even put pictures of people, so if you run into them somewhere, you can be like, I saw you on the internet. Um, but again, there are eight. Our regional map is not the same as any other regional map we have found. We're similar to a couple others, but ours are very unique, as every other agency is, tends to have. Field staff is very unique to themselves. If you want to go ahead and move to the next one. Um, so I do have q and I'm going to let Scott speak first and then we'll do Q&A all at once or we can do them on the panel. One thing I do want to tell you is when you see a letter of intent or a letter of interest, we call it an LOI, we want to see that you're interested. This is your rough draft. This is do your best and let us give you feedback. Every grant opportunity we have as an agency, we are very adamant that we provide you feedback because there's nothing worse than finding out you didn't get a grant and you have no idea why. We want to make sure that you're competitive for the next round. We've had several applications who came in one, two, and three times and weren't funded, but by that fourth and fifth time, they were. 
because they listened and they really found a way to work with it and make it eligible, make it competitive, whatever it may be. Believe it or not, we're an agency who actually likes to give out our money and we want to make sure that everyone has access to that. So I know I speak very quickly and again, I will answer any questions you guys have. I wanted to make sure we got you that. But without much further ado, here is Scott to talk about his work with Main Street. So I knew I couldn't explain all that and I thought it was more important to have um, Colette, a uh, representative from OCRA, here to be ava available to answer your questions. Um, what I'm going to do is try to explain a, a program that uh, I've been involved in but somewhat inherited. Um, I've been the, uh, uh, as uh, JP mentioned, uh, city planner with the city of Richmond since 2003 and uh, became the uh, executive director for Center City Development Corporation in January of this year. So six months into it, um, still trying to master the technology. Um, wanted to mention that as city planner, I uh, was very involved in promoting the quality of place standards for downtown, including bike and pedestrian opportunities, historic preservation, and upstairs housing. Um, we've talked about this block a little bit. Our, we changed our zoning code to be able to promote uh, commercial, light commercial use in a residential neighborhood. We also promoted uh, changes for allowing upstairs housing on our Main Street commercial district. So, yes, we are the Main Street organization. We were formed in 1987. However, in 2003, we changed our business name to Center City Development Corporation to reflect development of the Uptown Innovation Center as a business incubation center and meeting facility. Between 2008 and 2012, uh, we worked with the city to be designated as a hub for our certified tech park, uh, which has allowed us to significantly promote computer technology, and knowledge-based business development downtown. These businesses desire and expect vibrant, engaged downtowns. So uh, what, what we established uh, in 2014, as a stellar community designation came together, the city's Metropolitan Development Office, the Urban Enterprise Association, Indiana Landmarks, and Center City worked uh, together to create an upstairs housing grant program. Uh, we put together, uh, pooled $110,000 from our Redevelopment Commission's TIF, or Tax Increment Financing Fund, and $10,000 from a, a, a local nonprofit called EGG, Economic Growth Group, to create a $120,000 pool for six $20,000 grants. We've completed five of those and we're holding on to the remaining amounts uh, to, to apply them to a key redevelopment project as we determine what the best one is. The great thing is that this generated hundreds of thousands of dollars of private investment in buildings, building improvements, let alone increased property taxes. And we've committed to the uh, Redevelopment Commission to monitor and track the impact that this is having on uh, property tax rates because that will then uh, be important for the tax increment financing continuing. What's interesting is that these, uh, these buildings basically drew empty nesters to downtown and two younger uh, families all in uh, business professional uses or entrepreneurship opportunities. One of the standards that we, we made sure that we enforced was that the building must be owner occupied. And that is what helped put, uh, put the need to think entrepreneurially for these building owners. What would they be doing within the building if the, the storefront was zoned for commercial use? And then determining uh, qualified expenditures uh, included, but not limited to, plumbing, flooring, roofing, windows, and HVAC systems. We found that the, uh, the biggest issues became building code compliance, real estate stability, and facade considerations, which I'll address as we get into the particular projects. Ironically, 
uh, all these projects are basically within a block of each other. We have uh, three in the 900 block and two just around the corner on South 9th Street. The absolute number one lesson learned uh, for our organization was to be sure and require before pictures of all interiors. Frankly, after the project is over, it can be almost impossible to get pictures. Everyone loves the excitement of a project in progress, but after that, life goes on. People get busy, the uh, computers that they had the, the photos on crashes. Uh, it's also creating private living space that's very uh, touchy to re-enter, and we do want to respect that. We want to encourage private residential use in the downtown. So, gonna run through some of our uh, projects just very quickly. You'll notice the left two, two pictures, there's one kind of inset there. On the very left, you'll, you'll see that there actually were three stories to this building that in the middle now reflects just two stories and they had filled in some of the windows with glass block. Um, what we have here on the right are pictures of the roofing material going on ready to stabilize that roof. The property had been under single ownership but legal arrangements uh, were created to split the ownership so funds would be available for two residential units being developed. This still meets the owner occupancy requirement and it is an important tool to have available for development of larger properties. This is now uh, two private residences, uh, ironically for uh, a family and their parents. Um, they operate a bridal and occasion wear business on the first floor and a dance studio. Uh, important work element was roofing, as you saw. Um, the uh, replacement windows allowed the building to have a more appropriate looking window arrangement on the front. Removal of a dividing wall, which you can see on the left there, uh, allowed creation of a great room across the front of the building. The kitchen island, the owners are rightfully proud of, incorporates wood beams from a family barn mixed with industrial style beams because the one family member is an electrical contractor to support the countertop, coupled with exposed ductwork, creates a unique urban feel to the space. And if it were a little less fuzzy, you'd be able to see the images of some of the downtown facades across the street. Our next building, Sam and John Purcell, uh, had, prior to their ownership, the owner received an Urban Enterprise Association facade grant of $20,000. We have stellar facade projects that are going to be uh, taking place, but this was one that uh, happened before that. On the left, in the middle, you can see the, uh, the iron curtain, uh, which was brought down to expose the uh, very nice Italianate details there. And on the right are window replacements going in and a re revamped storefront. This uh, is owned by a, a couple, she is a, grad, a SCAD grad, Savannah College of Art and Design, um, and she has a degree in uh, fiber arts. She has ply fiber arts, which is a wonderful business. And she uses the front yard component of the property to really promote her business. Structurally, however, um, John, is, and his father, uh, his father Jerry is the uh, Richmond uh, Fire Commissioner, uh, had a contract experience, um, our con experienced contractors. Their best advice to property owners was to not expect new construction quality. If you can't embrace the fact that your walls might not be entirely plumb, maybe you shouldn't be in an old downtown building. And they shared that because uh, at the back of the building, so much of the brick had deteriorated, the uh, lath and plaster had fallen off, that when uh, other potential building owners for downtown came through, they were absolutely appalled, not realizing that that was really not structural. The building was wonder in very good condition, uh, but they were seeing cosmetic issues that uh, they then were able to repair through this project. Another uh, project, having been the, the city staff working with our preservation commission, we always 
kind of uh, understand that there are, not every building is an outstanding architectural gem. Uh, I think if you compare on the, the left, that little building by the alley there is probably a, a not an architectural gem. But it's an important opportunity for economic development in our downtown. Kim Hoppe uh, was in Indianapolis. She's a Richmond native. She was looking to return to Richmond and open up a business, um, but didn't want to have a house and a business to try to maintain. She spent a lot of time working with contractors to find the right building that would allow this special element, this roof deck, <laughs> that really be has become a shining example of urban living. Uh, she gets to, to view the, the wonderful aspects of a revitalized downtown neighborhood. Um, it shows that people enjoy being out and are visible in our downtown. So this has been uh, one of our wonderful projects. Uh, the, the last project actually was a house within our commercial district, uh, but it has a commercial use on the first floor, which is uh, Runnell's uh, chiropractor. And Casey lives upstairs. The funds help to bring that residential component up into a, a quality that really promotes uh, quality living in our downtown. So lessons learned, and, and I'm trying to uh, zip through this very quickly because I realize I'm the only thing that stands between you and lunch, uh, <laughs> is the fact that um, dealing with building codes. Uh, as I reviewed projects with building owners, the best advice they had was to involve a design professional early on in the project. It's important to make sure proposed work can meet residential construction standards before approving that work. Regulated, uh, related to building code, make sure land use regulations support that use. Some communities, if you're interested in trying to establish this in your downtown, you may have to look at your land use codes. And, it, and modify some of those. For example, uh, consider lessening regulations of off-street parking requirements so that landlocked lots have options to, to actually park somewhere else. And many of our residents are doing that. Real estate issues. Make sure the property can be acquired with a clean title. Um, as we found with the, uh, the Cummins property, being able to uh, create a new ownership arrangement is very important. If, if there isn't a clean title, uh, things can get messy very quickly. Understand what ownership arrangements you require before approving funding. Uh, what percentage? Does it have to be 50-50 ownership of a building? Um, under, understand that up front and publicize it so that when the next person wants to come up, you just allowed them to do something why wouldn't it be appropriate in this case? So think through your approval process and be able to justify it. Uh, let's see. Final thing is understanding uh, where there might be e uh, egress, exit issues, or easements involved in the property. Kim looked at a couple of different properties downtown, but they, there were easements that prevented uh, the ability to create egress. So that ultimately drove her to the building that she chose, which wasn't one of the architecturally fancy ones, but it sure has worked for her. F finally, facade issues. Work with your preservation commission to decide how stringent your facade standards are to be. I could probably save all of this for the post-lunch discussion because these projects that impacted facades weren't through our Preservation Commission. These were interior rehabilitation projects. And so I'm, I'm just going to leave that for after lunch. So from our organization standpoint, some of the things that uh, I have learned that I would want to share with you is have a committee working with this. Uh, a committee of community members involved in housing projects um, a realtor, a third party contractor, in other words, a contractor that you, that you can talk to in an unbiased uh, sort of opinion, downtown business owner who has already successfully created upstairs housing uh, projects, and very important to get that perspective. 
they may be a little resentful that now they're not able to get this, this, this fun, but their perspective is very important. In advance of program development, include reference to the need for housing, residential development, or facade restoration in any community planning documents or organizational goals in order to help justify use of public funds or for grant applications. So once again, it's all about planning. Make sure your plans include this so that when you're ready to fire the gun, you've got it there. Some side benefits that, that I would share is that this puts extra eyes downtown. Our, many of our downtowns suffer from the, and I'm sorry I see many bankers and a, a lawyer or two here, from banker lawyer hours. Everybody's there, they leave. And after that, there's nobody really downtown appreciating what's going on, reporting what's going on, and guiding what's going on. Our new residents downtown have really helped to enliven the downtown and make it an area where people who might have been a little cautious about living downtown feel engaged. They feel welcomed. Um, many of them, because they're merchants, have started having um, third Thursday evening, late evening hours. It's, sometimes it's hard to get downtown businesses to stay open late. There's a perception nobody's there. Well, the, the merchants are going above and beyond the job to be open, to have live music, to make it a, a, a lively area, just as a regular course of business, not just a special sort of thing. Um, let's see. What we hope to do uh, in the next component is to be able to look at opportunities to provide structural evaluation assistance. Other code standards, such as fire suppression, uh, or egress opportunities, and then be able to help uh, troubled buildings that might be dealing with legal issues. I, I have a ton of notes that uh, I was jotting while, while Marsh was uh, talking about um, the idea that working, partnering with your Preservation Commission is really important early on and communicating what your goals are in the way of not only building use, but preservation standards or preservation expectations. That level of communication is really important to, to, to take on early on. Uh, Matt, two minutes for questions? Two. Two. Do I have two? Susan. Can you give us a sample of someone um, building kind of uh, efficiently and spending time on the I should just say no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, it, mainly the life safety issues, knowing when to, uh, when you have um, the opportunity to work with grandfathered residential use, being able to show that yes, this has always been a residential use in these upper floors versus change to different building codes, not zoning codes, but building codes that then require you to meet new standards. You're all hungry. Any questions about uh, okra? Although Colette will be uh, back and I think will be part of our uh, panel after the lunch. So uh, again, thank you very much for, for your patience as we got through some of the technical issues and we'll be available after lunch. Thank you, Scott and Colette. Um, just kind of give a little time for them to set up lunch. Um, Richmond Columbian Properties is an organization that's been in existence since 1921. However, in our new capacity as an um, advocate for uh, community reinvestment, neighborhood redevelopment, We've been an organization for about six years. Um, our goal is to provide information about issues related to reinvestment and, and neighborhood development. That's why we have this conference every year. We're offering the uh, tools, the successes of other communities uh, to you that you could perhaps use in your own communities 
and hopefully in our own community as well here in Richmond. Um, the, um, the theme of this conference is the place says the message. And this is something that struck me when I attended the um, Easter men's prayer breakfast at First English Lutheran Church. And I'm taking this theme from Pastor John Walker's message called The Place Says the Message. And it was focused on where you stand, where you are when you visit, say, an important place. You know, in, in, in the Christian sense, when you visit the historic Jerusalem or places where Christ walked, you feel that sense of spiritual uh, renewal. You go to a place like the Alamo, you know the sacrifice that was paid there, the price paid for the, uh, the freedom of places like Texas, Gettysburg, the high watermark of the Confederacy, Philadelphia, where our country was born, Washington, D.C., where our government is centered, although some people may not think it's special. But it's, 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 it's a sense of a special feeling that you get by being in that place. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sense of greatness, spirituality, and pride. And how does that relate to just any other place? Our communities are places, and they have a message to say. And it's how we project that message as a community that tells about us as a community, as the people who make up that community. So how we treat our place, our community, is very, is very important. And that we build our quality of life, that we are proud of our environment, are proud of our community, and that we're working hard to make it a very special place where when you come to visit a place like Richmond, Indiana, you're gonna feel very good about it. This is a really nice town. It's beautiful, it's beautiful architecture. The people are beautiful. The people who live in your community feel that same sense of place. I'm proud of my community. It's a great place to live and I'm gonna do what I can to make it a better place to live. So in that, the place says the message. First, I'd like to recognize our sponsors. Um, I want to first recognize First Bank Richmond. First Bank Richmond, I think, is our guardian angel. They have always been very supportive of Richmond Columbian properties and all the things that um, we've been doing uh, in our work. Uh, for me personally, um, Bob Fix has always said that I would not have a roof over my head if it weren't for him <clears throat> because of the house and the nature of the house that we bought back in 1988. Um, Paul and Pat Lingle, uh, I tell you what, Paul, uh, uh, Art Vivian's finally looking down upon you for all the good work you do in Richmond. You certainly have continued that tradition of uh, stewardship for our community and we are very lucky to have people like you here to, to make things happen in a positive way. We sure appreciate all the help you've given us with not only this conference but in some of our other programming uh, through Economic Growth Group. Um, <clears throat> R&B architectural firm out of Indianapolis, uh, they do have a display of their work here uh, they've been coming to the conference for a number of years and have always been very supportive uh, of our efforts and we certainly appreciate what you're doing. Um, Eric Van Vliet and Van Vliet Bartle, they just came on as a new sponsor. But Eric has always been very supportive of Columbian Properties, especially when it comes to the uh, insurance aspect of things and <laughs> you know, keeping the wolves at bay, so to speak. Um, being a nonprofit, I um, want to recognize uh, uh, Bill and Sandy Armstrong for their help in this. Uh, Sandy's a member of the committee, 
and a member of the Richmond Columbian Properties Board. Um, also on the list is Matt and Jenny Stegall, but I'm going to give all the credit to Jenny. Um, our partners in this uh, endeavor, of course, is Indiana Landmarks, uh, Center for Community Progress for allowing uh, Tamar to be with us today, and Place Economics. Uh, Place Economics is an organization that has pioneered the right-sizing strategies of communities of declining population and, and blight, uh, led by Donovan Rickma, who Marsh mentioned earlier, has spoken twice at our conference. So we still work very closely with Place Economics and, and, and gladly accept their guidance and leadership in what we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> I want to recognize the uh, volunteers for the committee that organized this event, um, Sandy Armstrong, uh, Penn Ann Sorg, and Beth Fields. They're the lovely ladies that took your uh, uh, registration. Um, Scott Zimmerman, who spoke with us. Um, Mike Fields, or Flowers, excuse me, Mark, Mike Flowers from Indiana Landmarks. He was instrumental in bringing in Colin to the, uh, to the uh, event today, a terrific job. Um, volunteers who have helped, uh, Jan Foyne, uh, Teresa Braun, Jackie Breitenbach, uh, Pat Murray, and our technical advisor, Eric Green. Thank you all for helping out today. That really means a lot to us. Um, during our conference, we created a few years ago, an award, and it's it's an interesting story because, Mar I just I spring things on people sometimes, and I do it all the time for poor Marsh Davis, but he he takes it with great uh, zeal and and uh, enthusiasm. So, the first year we did this, we recognized a gentleman named Wayne Vincent, who was a yeoman in the early days of preservation in Richmond. When, when it was not cool, he was cool. And he was a great mentor of mine. And um, <clears throat> he didn't want any awards. His wife said he's got enough awards on his wall. He doesn't need any more. So we just offered a, a, a glad pat on the back. Um, so every year we've done something different as far as something kind of quirky as far as our Preservation Hero Award. This year, I found something in my archive that's uh, kind of neat. My great uncle Byron Bond was a commercial artist and printer. And he did some fantastic uh, types of artwork from chalk to oils to watercolors, pen and ink. He's probably more famous for his pen and ink things. And during the sesquicentennial year of our state, he did a historic map of Indiana that pointed out on location uh, some of the important uh, historical facts about our state. And there against the wall is the map. It's the original print uh, from what Byron put together. But I'm going to call on Marsh Davis because he's, this is a, a uh, an award that's sponsored in cooperation with both Richmond Columbian Properties and Indiana Landmarks, and I'm going to have him talk about our preservation hero. Well, that's a pleasure to be part of the presentation of this award. Matt started to tell the story, but didn't quite get to the, the, the part where I was on my way out here for the first very first conference, and, and he says, you know, we're going to give an award to Wayne Vincent today. We, we need to, what are we going to call this thing? So I'm on my way out here, literally, and, I, and so I said, I don't know. I mean, we don't have, Landmarks doesn't have an award that we can dispense of immediately. I don't have it in my back pocket. says, how about we just call it the Preservation, Preservation Hero Award? And so that's how we got this award, and it's been a tradition now with this conference, and now in our fifth year. So that's how we got it, and it's, it seems to be an, an effective way to recognize um, a person or an institution in this community who has done 
done great work for, for the, the cause that we're, we're gathered here to, to celebrate. And this year's Preservation Hero Award, and this is, an, again, Richmond Columbian Properties and Indiana Landmarks uh, um, co-conspire in, in this presentation. This year it goes to the Wayne Bank and Trust for the work that they've been doing to help us with a very significant project. Um, I mentioned it in, in my talk a couple of times. You'll see it out across the street. This is 231 to 33 North 10th Street, a, a long suffering house that, uh, uh, that we have an obligation to, to uh, see that it gets rehabilitated as part of the revitalization of this corridor between the downtown and the depot district in Richmond. But Wayne Bank and Trust has been instrumental in this because they hold the note on the property and they are willing to convey the property to Indiana Landmarks, to, 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 to clear, clear the deed and convey the property to Indiana Landmarks at no cost. We then will in, invest some of our funds, and, and I mentioned earlier the Redevelopment Commission committed $200,000 to this project. But it couldn't have happened without, without um, Wayne Bank and Trust, without its president, Mark Sukup, who uh, attended this, this conference in the past, and it was, it was the, the work of Colombian properties and the inspiration from this conference that led him to, to conclude that he wants to be in on this activity. So it's the work that, that many of you are doing here in Richmond, the, the, the power of this gathering, um, and the work over time that Columbian Properties has, has committed to in this area that, that, that led Mark and the Wayne Bank and Trust to, uh, to jump in for real and now convey to us a property which, I, as I said before, I hope that next year when we gather here that this is a, a place that we can tour with great pride um, so it's with that that we present the, the Preservation Hero Award in 2016 to the Wayne Bank and Trust and representing uh, Mark Sukup could not be, the president could not be with us, but we have Lorene Roth and Eric Van Vliet to, to accept the award on behalf of the Wayne Bank and Trust. So, yeah. Anything on behalf of the bank? Sure. Yeah. I think uh, this was an easy, easy decision for the bank to make in terms of uh, giving this property to such an energized and committed group. We know it's in great hands, and uh, we look forward to see how you can improve on it. Thank you very much for the award. I know the bank will enjoy the award and appreciate the recognition. Noreen? Now, whoever said preservationists were not behind the times? I mean, Sussex with Centennial, that was 50 years ago, we're, so it's, you know, we're just a little bit behind with that, but uh, maybe in 50 years we'll give out the Centennial map. Of, Preservation of, of, is timeless. Preservation is timeless, Matt says, indeed. Thank you all, congratulations, Wayne Bank and Trust, and thank you for your support of this project. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Is that it? Right. <clears throat> I have to tell you, you know, our awards quirky. We don't give out trophies. It's, we want to give out something that you're going to really appreciate. Last year, our recipient was Joe Chamnus, who has been a stalwart supporter of historic preservation. And I had a piece of um, an artifact sitting in the carriage house there at the funeral home. It was a piece of uh, scrap metal from the old Westcott Hotel. So it's now a lawn ornament in his yard. <laughs>